My name is Reverend Sister Kama, and I'm happy to be with you one more time. This evening, we're going to talk a little bit about two subjects. One subject is how can the hindrances be our friends and be our teachers in our meditation practice? And the second thing that I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, is that uh, how firm do you think the Buddha wanted you to have your meditation practice? How firm did he want you uh, to be in your equanimity as you were practicing? And we're going to visit the text this time a little bit. We are going to start with the uh, Dueda Vitaka Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. And this is the way that we were taught in the uh, Dhammasukha Meditation Center. We listened to the teacher and he listened, uh, he read the suttas to us and then uh, he expounded on one of the topics. And I hope that you enjoy this. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove in Anathampandika's Park. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied, and the Blessed One said this. Now, Bhikkhus, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes, and then I set one side, on one side, the thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty, and I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. And as I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me, and I understood thus. This thought of sensual desire has arisen in me, and this leads to the afflict, my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, it causes difficulties, and it leads away from Nibbana. When I considered this, that it leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. And when I considered this leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. And when I noticed that it led to the uh, affliction of both, it subsided in me. So this person is aware of what is happening while he is in his meditation. He is watching how things are pulling his mind. And when these unwholesome states arise, he's watching very carefully what's happening, how it works within his life when he's out of meditation. He said that this kind of thought, the unwholesome thoughts, obstruct wisdom, cause difficulties, and lead away from Nibbana. And when I realized that, it subsided in me. So he has some knowledge that he's working with, a way that he can let go, recognize when this is happening, and then release. Now, in the other, uh, other vignettes that we have done here, I have talked to you about the fact that the craving actually has a symptom. It's a very interesting thing that the Buddha found this symptom of a rising tension and tightness in mind and in body when the craving is coming up. And when that happens, you have a chance to detect when some, you're on an object of meditation and you are pulled away from that object of meditation, you have a chance of letting go of whatever it is that's pulling you away and relaxing and then coming back to your object of meditation. If you try this little maneuver of releasing and relaxing before coming back, you begin to lower the level of tension and tightness inside the mind, inside the body. And as you do this, you will systematically be moving 
towards the goal of Nibbana, you will be cleansing and purifying the mind of any of the tension and the tightness that causes the stress. And these things, as we have said, are the seed for the anger, for the uh, anxiety, for the depression. These are the seeds. So it's very important that you notice that the way that he is abandoning and removing and doing away with the hindrance is not by oppressing it, destroying it, and annihilating it, and eradicating it directly, but by not feeding it personal attention with Atta perspective and getting involved with it personally. If we leave it alone, then it doesn't grow fat like a little puppy that's overfed. If we don't feed this hindrance, it will simply stop coming to your door and it will fade away. This is a very, very important thing to understand. He goes on and he says that, as I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of ill will arose in me, a thought of cruelty arose in me, and I understood that this was arising in me, and it led to my own affliction, and the affliction of others, and the affliction of both. And I realized that whenever this thought of cruelty arose in me, it obstruct wisdom, caused difficulties, led me away from my goal of the liberation of mind. And it was uh, a thought of cruelty that arose in me or of ill will. I abandoned it. I did away with it. And I simply let it go. It's an interesting thing about the words that are used in the text. I just want to point out that there are two sets of verbs operating in the Pali Canon. One set of verbs is talking about the annihilation, eradication, and destruction of the hindrances. And that's the goal of what we want them not to come up and bother us anymore. However, when we look at those words, they're pretty strong, those verbs. But if we can accomplish that through the renunciation, abandonment, release, and letting go of these types of arising disturbing thoughts or phenomena and then that result turns out to be the destruction, annihilation and eradication of those visiting hindrances, well then, we've accomplished our goal. But in the process of accomplishing our goal, we have not gotten tight at all. We have developed a perfect and balanced level of concentration that we can call a collectedness and focus that is perfectly aligned with progressing through the levels of attainments and reaching the state of the liberation of mind. Now in this sutta, the Buddha pointed out to the monks that the bhikkhus, he said, whenever a bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders upon that will become the inclination of his mind. So he is telling you directly, whatever you think in your mind, that is where your mind is going to continue to go. So what we want to be careful of, we want to take careful care and volition or will to do things. We want to be very careful that when these dispositions arise in our mind, when they come up to bother us, that we don't get overly tense. We simply see them for what they actually are. They're visitors knocking at your door. Essentially, they arise, and they're here to get your personal attention. If we understand that anatta is the answer for us, then we shift our perspective and take these visitors impersonally. It doesn't mean we have to be mean to them. We can certainly ask them to come in, sit down, have tea, and then they can leave. But we don't have time to sit down and have long discussions with them or to get involved with figuring out all kinds of numerous things 
and further involvement of thinking with them when they come to visit. So this is the lesson that we find here. And we realize that when he is talking about the unwholesome states, he is talking about the danger, the degradation, the defilement, and in the wholesome states that he, he can have instead, he is talking about the blessings of renunciation. Renunciation of what? The renunciation of these unwholesome states of mind and replacing them with the purification system that we talked about, using right effort. First, recognizing that they're coming up. Second, releasing them as soon as we notice them and relaxing. Third, noticing that we can re-smile and return with a cessation of this pressure, a cessation of this feeling of tension and tightness. And then we can keep going with this released state of, and we can smile or bring up wholesome thoughts, thoughts of compassion, thoughts of loving kindness, thoughts of non-cruelty. These are the things that can replace these unwholesome thoughts. This is really interesting, and it really works. You see, the universe has a kind of law of its own. We've discovered at MIT in the last number of years, there's no such thing as a vacuum, meaning that it's empty. You can have a vacuum, but it's not the same definition anymore. Now there are quarks running around in it and other types of substratum and quantum physical types of units moving around in the system. So nothing's really empty. And when you're empty of one thing or void of one thing, there is something else. And what is here is only what is here at this particular time. This is useful to people. It makes it so that you can apply it to the lessons of the past and of the future and of the present moment. Only thing that is here is the present moment. So when you feel something arising, if you release it, you relax, you smile, and you come back over to what your object of meditation is or coming back to your daily task and keep that going with a smile, with loving kindness in it, then you've accomplished the purification. You have completed the aspect of cleansing that the Buddha was talking about in Majjhima Nikaya, uh, number 19, the Dweda Vidaka Sutta. Now, there are some other lessons here that the Buddha taught about how firm we should possibly work to keep our practice. If we go back to the Maha Rahula Vada Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya, number 62, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, we're going to find on page 529, we will find that he talks about in this sutta, each one of the elements, but then he goes even further to discuss how you should apply your knowledge of these elements to helping you to balance your meditation. The Buddha was talking to his son, and he says to him, Rahula, Develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain there. They won't pull you out of the present moment. You'll treat them just as, act as they actually are. Just as people will throw clean things and dirty things but excrement and urine and spittle and blood upon the earth. And the earth is not horrified. It is not humiliated. It doesn't get disgusted. Because of that, too, Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop your meditation that is like the earth, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable contacts, neither one will invade your mind and remain. So the Buddha is telling you here that your job with equanimity 
is to learn how to accept things as they actually are. Accept them as they are essentially without adding a lot more into your mind about what you're seeing or you're hearing or you're experiencing. Look at things as the truth. Try to see them as it only what's happening in the moment, what's happening in the present time. He says to him, Rahula, develop meditation that's like the water. For when you develop meditation that is like the water, arisen, agreeable, or disagreeable, those contacts will not invade your mind and remain, just as people wash clean things and dirty things, excrement, spittle, blood in the water, and the water is not horrified. It does not become humiliated or disgusted because of that. So too, Rahula, develop your meditation that is like water. For when you develop meditation that is like water, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind, and they won't remain. Rahula, develop your meditation that is like the fire. For when you develop meditation that is like the fire, agreeable and disagreeable arisen contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Just as people will burn clean things and dirty things, they will burn the excrement, the urine, the spittle, the pus, the blood, and the fire is not horrified about it. It does not become humiliated or disgusted. Because of that, so too, Rahula, develop your meditation that is like the fire. For when you develop your meditation that is like the fire, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind anymore. So he's telling you that if you develop your meditation so that it is firm, it is balanced, and your understanding takes the knowledge that we've been talking about the last few days, and you use this knowledge as your base, then you make conscious decisions to let go, relax, see things as they actually are, because you know they will arise and they will pass away. This is the lesson. This is what he's trying to show his son. Rahula, develop meditation that is like the air, for when you develop meditation that is like the air, agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind, and they won't remain. Just as the air blows on clean things, it blows on dirty things. It blows on the excrement, urine, spittle, pus, blood, and the air is not horrified. It is not humiliated. It is not disgusted. Because of that, so too, Rahula, a deep, develop meditation that is like the air. And when you do develop meditation that is like the air, any arisen, agreeable or disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind. And then he says the same thing about developing meditation that is like space. For when you develop your meditation like space, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable contacts they will not invade your mind anymore. And they will not remain. Just as space is not established anywhere, so too, Rahula, develop meditation that is like space. For when you develop meditation that is like space, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable things will not come and invade your mind, and they will not remain. And then he gives Rahula a specific set of instructions in order to develop his levels of attainment in his meditation. He directs him to develop meditation on loving kindness. For when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any ill will will be abandoned because loving kindness counters the ill will. It will cause a rebalancing within your mind. It will cause a rebalancing within your system. Rahula developed meditation on compassion. You develop meditation on compassion, then any cruelty will be abandoned. Why? Because 
compassion is the balancing factor for cruelty. It's the opposite that weighs down to come to a balance between compassion and cruelty. Rahula, develop meditation on appreciative joy. For when you have developed meditation on appreciative joy, any discontent will be abandoned. And this appreciative joy or altruistic joy means that in relationships, you should try to look at this and try to develop this aspect of your relationships. For if you are husband and wife or friends or mothers and daughters, success of the other person, you step back, you enjoy their success. This becomes your quiet and contented joy. If they see you and they relate to enjoying the fact that they see you succeed in what you're doing, then they have a good contentment and peace inside of them. This is a very good balancing factor. It is a form, the altruistic joy is an advanced form of the development of dana. Dana in the sense of mental, verbal, and physical actions. Develop meditation on equanimity, for when you develop meditation on equanimity, any aversion will be abandoned. Equanimity is a state that is the balancing point that helps you move into looking more seriously at the seven enlightenment factors. And I hope that when I come back next time, we can break down and talk about the individual groups within the 37 requisites of enlightenment. We can show how these pieces quite possibly could have been the part of a beautiful, beautiful Dhamma tapestry, how they're interwoven, how they step and move one to the other as they're going along, and how they complement each other in your developmental line while you're making your meditations uh, and working to succeed with that. So equanimity is a very stilling aspect for us. I'm going to talk about equanimity. It's kind of an interesting little story. When I was on the mountain the uh, first or second year, I think it was about the second year, I sort of hit equanimity in my practice, but I didn't know it. And I was in there in the morning, and I talked to the teacher, and he smiled, and he just let me go back to work, and I kept working with this extreme balance, this feeling of whatever I was doing was just fine. I had no further comment of it's just really fine. The equipment is fine. The forest is fine. The dogs who are with me are fine. Everything was working fine. And then something funny happened. Someone came to me and they said, it's going to rain. Would you go down the mountain and go to the small mountain store and get us some milk? These college kids wanted their milk and wanted me to bring it up for them. So I got in the old truck and I started driving down the mountain. And I'm going along and it's raining, really starts to rain hard. And I'm thinking, hmm. This is interesting. And I get down near the bottom. There's a big hill that goes down like this and turns very sharp and turns again to get to the bottom. Well, the truck starts down, and on either side, on one side, the outside, which is slanted down, uh, there's about a 150 foot drop with no edge on the road. And in front of me on the curve, there's no edge on the road either. And so what happened to me was, as the car's brakes, the truck's brakes, just didn't work, I slid down the mountain and I managed fine to get down to the bottom and around the bottom curve and I stopped. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited a little bit longer. I was waiting for a reaction in my heart and I was waiting for a reaction in my stomach because it was really um, a very, it should have been, a very, very scary thing that just happened. I was surprised I was able to just control the vehicle and get to the bottom and stop at the bottom before I kept driving to the store. And it was a funny experience because I was only about two years into this meditation practice and uh, I knew I had experienced something very, very, very unusual. And so I went to the store and got the milk, and then I started back up the mountain. 
And as I started driving up the mountain, I started thinking. Well, that was wrong. <laughs> but I started thinking. And I started to begin to actually develop the thinking into, I don't like this, that nobody explained to me what this was. And why didn't he tell us more about this? And by the time I got up to the mountain, I was all worked up. And I went to the teacher's hut. And I knocked on the door. He came to the door. And he said, what's up? And I said, well, I explained the whole thing. I got in the truck. I went down the mountain. The brakes gave out. I slid down to the bottom. And I had no reaction at all. Do you want to explain this to me? And he said, uh, well, that's called equanimity. Your body and your mind has absolutely no reaction to what is happening. Someone could shoot a gun off right next to you, and you would say, well, somebody just shot a gun off next to me. Yeah, you know, a big side of the mountain could fall down, and you'd stand there and say, well, those rocks on the mountain, they just fell down, and that's what's real in the present moment. You don't get upset. This, this state of equanimity is much, much deeper and different from something people call indifference. This is not indifference. This is just non-reactive emotional stress, and it's all gone in mind and in body, in heart and in stomach. So when I looked at the teacher, I said, well, you should have told us, you should have told us that this equanimity, you should have told us something about it. And he said, well, you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I said, why? He said, because you're not in it anymore. And that was the first experience that I had with this equanimity. And I realized this was something very different. And another time we were sitting, four of us together, and all of a sudden a trash can lid in a, just fell off a metal trash can and hit the floor that was tile and just reverberated through the room. But none of the four of us stopped meditating. And when we were finished, we paused and we looked at each other and said, what happened for you? What happened for you? Did you hear that? And we all agreed we heard it, but we heard it very far in the distance. And we heard the reverberation of the sound, the vibration like this. And some of us saw the vibration go by in the dark. And some of us felt the vibration in our body. But the point is, most of us, the four of us, at least three of the four of us were totally in a state uh, uh, inside this bracket of equanimity. So we didn't move. We didn't move a muscle. We didn't break the sitting until uh, the teacher said it was over. And this was about a two-hour sitting. So see, this is the thing about equanimity is this incredibly neat experience. It's a very useful thing. Very, very useful. And then he said, Rahula, develop meditation on foulness. For when you develop meditation on foulness, any lust will be abandoned. And the foulness of the body is actually looking at the body as the body actually is. It's not searching for a body inside a body or anything like that. It's just looking at the body and seeing it exactly as it is. Essentially, the body is put together with this uh, with the uh, parts of the body and the 32 parts of the body that makes it clear that's exactly what the body is it isn't anything else and then he points out that perhaps it's good for him to be developing also the meditation on mindfulness of breathing and he starts to give him the instructions and explain to him what he should do with that so this is the nice sutta because it's the Buddha actually talking to his son, Rahula. And Rahula really had a pretty good uh, deal with his father. Although he died at the age of about 35, from the time he was seven until he was 35, he was involved with the monks. He had the, uh, the, um, the, friend, the Dhamma friends of Samap Samaputta, uh, Sariputta and... Um, of Moggallana and of um, Ananda, and had access to his father as he was growing up for advice. And the various monks were able to comment on him and help with him within the Sangha to develop his practice. And he actually had more access 
to uh, his father than many people probably have to their father while growing up. And then he moved away from where his uh, dad was, his, his, the Buddha was located, and then as he, he got older, he, he died at the age of roughly about 35. So we don't look at this as this was a very big uh, thing that he was not there when he was very, very little because when he was very, very little, his mother, Yusodra, was in the palace with extended family all around him. And actually that's a pretty unique situation for young children to have multiple sets of parents around your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, and in, in the relatives within your family paying attention to you and helping you as you're growing up. So it's, it's a very, very, uh, not a thing to be really upset about that that happened with him, but he had this good relationship with the monks. He got a lot of really good advice while they were growing up. Now one of the directives of the uh, Buddha gave to the monks that was very useful for them was the directive of what you think and ponder on. This is the inclination of your mind. But another one is what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. And this is a really good subject to think about because when you have that subject, it means you're not locked in or stuck with what you're doing. You're able to uh, actually have something to do with creating your future. And I think this is a very good aspect in Buddhism. You do have a say in your future because why? Because you can retrain your mind, you can walk a path of purification and learn that what you do in the present moment actually does dictate what happens in the future. And you can then, uh, for instance, smile and create more smiles in the future. So I think this visit to this text has been useful and I hope that we can have more times in the future where we can perhaps come back and talk a little more about the, um, the 37 requisites of enlightenment and how they work as you're developing your practice in relationship to the Four Noble Truths, in relationship to the three characteristics. And I want to thank all of you for all of the help that you have given me while I've been in Sri Lanka. And I do hope that you have many blessings in the future, much health, much good luck and prosperity, and that you stick with the Dhamma, stick with your practice, keep it simple, and let things go. Relax and smile. Come back and stay in the wholesome side of things, as the Dwita Vitaka Sutta advised us to do. Many blessings.